Hello, yeah. everybody. Go ahead, Charlie. Give us the welcome. I love your voice, man. I love your voice. <laughs> Aloha, everyone. Welcome to the Mel and Charlie Facebook Live here on, on Facebook Live. It's Saturday, July 18th. It's approximately 646 as we start early every time. How are you, my brother? And again, thank you for that wonderful brunch today. Mahalo, brother. Anytime, bro. So I think it's the first time in my life I was able to buy you lunch or breakfast or whatever <laughs> it was. But um, thank you for the company. Thank you for the. It was, you know, we did our social distancing. We had our masks, except when we ate. Yeah. I gotta tell you something though, Charlie. You're welcome. I love you. Um, hang on. You, you you really can eat, man. <laughs> no. Um, the re the reason is um. Just so you folks know that, you know, because um, my wife starves me the rest of the week. So I just. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, anyway, welcome, everybody. Tonight, part three in the three part series, uh, our state of uh, Hawaii State House of Representatives, District 16 tonight. And um, tonight we will have uh, our incumbent, Dee Morikawa, and her challenger, Anna Modez. They'll be on tonight as we have done for the two other districts, District 14 and District 15. Um, yep. And boy, Dee is on already, man. She must have been watching Facebook Live. But anyway, <laughs> uh, we will. the format will be the same for those of you that have been with us for the last two. Uh, and we'll have some fun tonight. We'll learn about our candidates. You know, I know the ballots are out. Many of you have voted. I see a lot of you people posting their sealed envelopes, getting ready to mail out or drop off, but uh, for those of you that haven't voted yet, for those of you out there in District 16, uh, pay attention tonight. You know, we'll ask some some tough questions. Uh, you know, they, they all had the questions in advance. So, uh, because we don't like to surprise anybody. I mean, we just don't, this is not what this is about. We're not here to debate. Uh, we're just here to, the, the questions really came from from you all. You know, we have a lot of questions uh, and we, we're keeping it at an hour. So they'll have ample time to, answer the questions that we put out there and um i'm looking forward to it i'm looking forward to it and i think we'll have a little um yeah, it'll be fun i think it'll be fun and i appreciate you guys joining in every single night uh with us kind of disappointing though charlie um on the on the viewership when we talk about the campaign or the politics of the election versus when we talk about covid i mean you brought that up that first night uh, when we look at the numbers of viewers, um, yeah, very, very, uh, probably about half. <laughs> well, you know, we, um, we have uh, COVID guests. We we do our studies, you know, like like uh, finding a cure. You go through se several trials to weed out the the high and lows, right? You what you're left with is a raw, and our raw data after tonight shows that our viewership. Loves to talk about COVID. <laughs> it, it, either that or they already resorted. It's okay. We know who we're gonna vote for. We don't like watch anything else, and they just don't watch. But I, you yeah. know, the, the the numbers, the numbers speak for itself. And yeah, what's what's interesting to note, what's interesting to note, is watch when a candidate speaks. You look at the upper left hand corner, and you're showing the views. You'll be able to see views spiking or dropping when a certain candidate speaks. I found that to be very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, when, and it's, you know, and, and this is just from my experience, you know, I was just thinking, you know, this is the first time since 2000 and 2000. Yeah, this is the first time since 2000 that my name is not on that ballot. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? I was just thinking about that today. Uh, man, what a trip. It's the first time it doesn't show up anywhere on the ballot. Um, so it's pretty yeah. cool being a non-candidate and uh, and working with you to facilitate these these forums. But I, I gotta say, it's a really different type of forum when it's online. You yep. don't have the energy of the crowd. Like if you're doing a forum, typically you answer a question, you'll get claps or you'll get boos. Uh, really, not too often. You know, I think most most of the crowds. But I gotta tell you, I've been booed uh, and I've been cheered. But it's different when you're talking to a camera. Uh, even though there's a lot more people that that's going to watch this online uh, forum, 
then that would typically be in a convention hall or at a neighborhood center or whatever. You get a lot more people watching. And there's a, the people that are watching this, uh, I would say are actually very interested in what the candidates have to say. So yes. it's a whole different, different perspective and, and the feeling for these candidates are different. And, and, they're, and they're having a lot more time in this forum to answer questions than they would normally in, in a traditional forum, which is something that I wanted to see because, you, you know, you, you, sometimes more is less. Uh, you know, last night, I, you noticed this, Charlie, last night we had the state house uh, candidates from District 15, and both candidates rarely used all their time. They mm -hmm. got to the point, they answered the question, and they, and they let it go, which is, I think, what is probably the right thing to do, rather than to just ramble on for three minutes because you have three minutes. So interesting, interesting. And, and if you notice, the viewership last night was, was higher than the night before. So the first night, nothing against the candidates. I mean, they took advantage of the time that they were granted. But you notice the viewers, just the viewership was down. And maybe it was because of the district. It was out there on the, uh, on the North Shore Eastern. district. Yeah. And a lot of people have already made up their minds. I don't know what, what it is, but uh, it was obvious that last night the viewership was higher. And we'll see what it is tonight. Now, tonight is a Saturday night. Uh, a lot of people... You know, they do things on Saturdays, but we will obviously replay this on the Facebook pages and we also will re replay it on, on YouTube. So er everyone who um, decided to go do something else tonight will have a chance to see at a later time. Well, I think, you know, for the most part, I, I have to attribute a lot because of the voting method, which is mail-in ballots. It will be different. People will not have to stand in line at the polling booths. Um, They'll have a chance to, you know, sit back because of uh, there haven't been too much coffee hours, sign waving, you know, all of the traditional things that you would normally see in a campaign. It's 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 pretty much what we do and what others do to get the candidate up onto a platform such as Facebook or Zoom and get them in front of the people. But like I said before, what's interesting to note. When you have a coffee talk or when you have, uh, say, they want to meet the candidate and you meet at a park, right? You, you bring some poo poo, you bring some drinks, you sit down. So you let the candidate talk. Usually you garner maybe about 20, 30. Sometimes you garner more depending, you know, if, they, if they're going to talk at the end of one uh, softball tournament or something. But for the most part, even if the viewership is down, for the numbers to come in as it's been coming in, even if you capture a couple hundred, it's way more than you normally would capture if you were to do it live. So, you know, and the people when they watch, what they can do is, because we have no commercials, but there is some downtime between, you know, between each candidate when they're talking. Um, the viewership can, uh, can basically... Uh, take their little, their little scroll and they can scroll it faster until they get to a point where they want to hear a question asked and they want to, they want to replay the question that the candidate gave and they wanted to make sure that they, they heard right. So there's a lot of advantages. There's a lot of advantages. Either We way. are going to see, we're going to see the outcomes. We're going to see, and you know what, I'm going to really, I'm looking forward to the post election uh, Facebook lives that we have and we bring on the candidates and we find out from them firsthand. I mean, we talk about the campaigns and how they, how they adjusted um, because of the, the, the pandemic restrictions. Um, it's going to be cool. It's going to be real cool. So yes. anyway, it is, uh, let's bring them in and we will go over the, the format and we have both of them in here. I love it when they are punctual, they're on time. And there we have both of the candidates here. Can you both hear us? Oh, these, these loading up right now, the audio. He's connecting. Anna, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Oh, yes. nice, loud and clear, loud and Thank clear. You. Okay, okay, D is on, D is on now. D, D can on. you hear us, D? I can hear you, can you hear me? Yes, very good, very good. Huh? Very loud. What's that? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> now? 
this is a very <laughs> non-traditional forum, as you can probably figure out. I'm not sure if you guys saw the uh, last two that we did over the last few nights, but um, I want to start off by saying thank you both. I know it's a Saturday night, so you know it's 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 not a night you want to spend uh, on an online forum, but uh, that's just the way the dates fell. And and uh, thank you both for making the time to share your thoughts, your ideas with the viewing public who uh, are right now with a scorecard figuring out who they're going to vote for. It's pretty cool. Now, both of you are in Charlie's district. Yes. So I would try like heck to, to uh, impress that man right there. <laughs> See, I, I, I love you both because I'm not in your district, so I don't have to pick. But anyway, we're going to have some fun tonight. We're going to have some fun. If you, uh, if you saw, we, our format is very simple. Uh, we're going to start off with a five-minute um, uh, overview. You get five minutes to say whatever you want. And uh, our timekeeper is none other than my wife, Patsy. And uh, she will tell me when you have two minutes left, you will get this. And that one minute, you will get this. And then when you're done, you will get the POW sign. Uh, and we randomly selected, oh, sorry about that. Please, now is the time to share. Share, 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 share your, do a watch party, do whatever you can. Let's get this out to as many people as we can uh, to inform and educate the public. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, <laughs> and then, um, and we randomly selected uh, the name. So D, you will go first tonight. So you will have your introduction first and then Anna, you will follow. And then we'll go to uh, questions. The questions you will have three minutes each. Uh, you don't have to, Use the three minutes, but you can. Um, you will have a one minute warning on the on the three minute question. So you'll get the one minute and then the foul. And um, we'll rotate. So D, you will get the first question. And then Anna, you will get the, the first question on the second, first response on the second question. So any questions? Nope. And I'm getting so good at this, this pregame warm up checklist that uh, I'm looking at my clock and man, we still get a minute to spare. See, we like to start on time and we want to end on time. So, cause we respect everybody's time. So with that, um, score, key, uh, score keeper, see, I missed putting them all. <laughs> I'm keeper. Are we ready? We are ready. Oh, what is that noise? Oh, oh, D you're messaging me. I'm messaging you. Yep. D Marco messenger video. You must've pushed the wrong button. Not me. You know Somebody. what? I think it's Ken doing something that he doesn't okay. understand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, I bet he's trying to share it. And it, it uh, okay. So anyway, timekeeper, you ready? Yes. No. D, you ready? Yes. Time starts now. All right. Thank you, Mel and Charlie, for giving people the opportunity to get to know candidates running for office. I mean, your program has grown and is so informative. Just a quick one, I don't lose my five minutes, but try Google um, Checkers and Pogo Pogo. <laughs> I love that show. But anyway, aloha. I'm Dee Morikawa and I represent Southwest Kauai and Nihau. I was born on the Big Island, Honoka. My father, Herbert Apak, was from Waipio Valley and my mom, Elaine Tyra, from Honoka. We lived in Kamuela, Waimea, where dad was a Parker Ranch cowboy. But my parents divorced when I was five and my brother and my sisters uh, were moved to Oahu to live with grandparents in the beautiful Waimea Falls Park. We were poor, but living off the land in a carefree environment taught me so much. I attended Sunset Beach Christian School and Kahuku High and Elementary inter Intermediate. But because I moved to Kauai in the end of my senior year, I officially graduated from Kapa High School. I now live in Waimea with my husband, Ken. We have four sons, one adult grandson, and now a nine-year-old Hanai daughter. Right out of high school, I began working as a summer hire with the County of Kauai and continued uh, county employment for 36 years. And most of those years, you know, Mel, were in parks and recreation. It was 10 years ago that I was first elected as a representative for District 16. As a legislator, I have served on many committees. I've chaired the committee and I'm currently the majority floor leader. And while working for Parks and Recreation, I would help with the capital improvement budget. And I always wondered how these projects, projects got funded because these projects went years and years and years on the books and never really got money. 
But now as a legislator, I understand how CIP projects can get state funding for county facilities. Your Kauai legislators have done a very good job of getting CIP monies to the island. And you can see that island-wide with the projects that are happening. And for District 16, schools are finally getting backlog maintenance money. Hana Paper Bridge is being re rebuilt. Port Island Boat Harbor is almost finished. The LLA Pedestrian Bridge taken away, but it's going to be reconstructed to accommodate the heights of vehicles. The LLA Hana Pepe water system has been upgraded, and that's going to allow for expanded capacity. Habitat for Humanities, the housing is growing in LALA and now in Waimea, and those houses are truly affordable. Hawaiian home beneficiaries will have more homes available in Hanapepe, and pastoral leases in Koke are being worked on. The Waimea Canyon uh, Middle School covered play court is almost done, and Waimea High School gym has planning and design money for a future replacement. Kikiola Boat Harbor has been dredged, and improvements to restrooms and water system will be underway shortly. Grant and aid funds will allow the King Kamuli statue to be constructed and the Lawai International Center will one day have a more permanent structure to accommodate visitors. These are just some of many more projects. Oh, and Charlie, we just got $20 million to address the Waimea crossing and the flood issues in Waimea Valley. Oh, great. Thanks great. to the please, um, uh, pro that's a county project. Thank you, Mayor. The past session, we had a package of priorities that would have addressed the high cost of living, but bam, we got hit with COVID. Now economic recovery is vital, but so is the safety of our residents. The governor's discussions with our mayor is the best way to assure we do this right. Fortunately, the legislature had built up the rainy day fund and federal funds have helped deal with immediate needs, but our financial future looks very dismal and scary. I'm confident though that we will get through this and we as leaders must make the tough decisions and stand by them. Mahalo. Okay. Thank you no. very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Sorry, I was muting out. Um, Anna, are you ready, Anna? Timekeeper, are we ready? Yeah. Time starts now. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Representative Morikawa. It's an honor to officially meet you. And um, I'm grateful for this opportunity for us to express ourselves in this capacity. All thanks to Mel and Charlie for creating a, a venue that we can all come together as candidates and uh, discuss the pertinent issues. And I am really grateful for it. Charlie, you're in our district, so I hope to earn your vote. And um, I really enjoyed how you hosted the mayoral debate and uh, gave you compliments. I'm not sure if you'd remember that day, but I do. And uh, big congratulations, Mel, on your, on your channel and uh, creating it. I'm glad you were inspired to do so. And I have to give a sh shout out to uh, pastry chef Patsy Raposo. <laughs> You're a lucky man. I hope she gets a foot massage every night from you. That's what she deserves, no less. But uh, back to why I'm here. My name is Anna Modes, and uh, that's not my legal name. That's my candidate name. So my candidate committee is under that same name. Any checks for uh, support and contributions can be written to Anna Modes. And on the ballot, I will appear as Des, comma, Animo. And we're going to be on the general ballot together. So thank you for having this uh, during primary time so that we can all start to get to know each other. Uh, I don't have any accolades or laurels to rest on. This is a, a passion fueled campaign that is a continuation to what I've been saying for three years. And uh, Mel, you're in an interesting position. I called you Mr. Chair uh, many times when I came forward to speak and I'll be repeating myself. So apologies to you, but um, it's something that needs to be said. For me, it's important to go and spend my energy at the root of the cause of the issues. And 
even before COVID, there's been a humanitarian crisis on this island, and I'm sure around the state. The economic disparity that is caused by exploitation results in the drug and alcohol abuse, the domestic violence, crime, homelessness, survival trafficking, and the eventual suicide. We must do everything in our capacity to balance this economic disparity, to level out the playing field so that the opportunities are established and accessible for everyone to reach out and provide the prosperity for their lives as we are meant to. Amer as Americans, we have this inalienable right to the pursuit of happiness. So it's not our job to provide equality for everyone, but it is important for the opportunities to be equal and accessible for everyone to do what they can to reach out and create the prosperity for their own family, sweat off the brow, innovation, creativity, inspiration to start whatever needs to happen for their own purpose on this planet. And we all have an individual purpose to serve. And we as government should remove the restraints that feel a bit like suffocation so that these new ideas can emerge, especially from our youth. Everyone is coming forward with a great idea and we need to allow everyone to participate in how we're going to appear in the future, all of us together. And uh, I'm looking forward to that because this isn't a mistake that this is all happening this way. This is intentional. And I'm grateful that there are so many intelligent minds and creative spirit because together we will move forward in harmony and finally live as we ought to live. So thank you for this opportunity to be here. And um, I look forward to this hour. There's nowhere else I'd rather be, Mel, on a Saturday night. This is exciting. So thank you. Me too, believe it or not. <laughs> thank you. Thank you both for that introduction. Okay, as I stated, we're going to go to the first question. Charlie will get the first question. It will be three minutes. Um, you'll go from three minutes, you get a one minute warning. There will be no two minute warning, okay? okay. Alrighty, Charles. Okay, we'll start off with B. You, you'll be answering. And again, I'll repeat the question again for you, Anna, as, as well. But you'll be starting off first, B. Because our island, we are an island, we are situated where we are. We are so dependent on everything brought in either by air or by boat. So what are your thoughts about the current situation with young brothers? And would you entertain the possibility of a ferry system that would allow residents and especially farmers to transport their goods to other islands? Yes, Charlie, I have always supported the ferry system. Hawaii invested a lot of money into the construction and infrastructure to accommodate the ferry system on all islands. If they didn't rush into it and had done it properly with the environmental assessments that were required, then I believe the ferries would still be in operation today. We lost millions of dollars on all that infrastructure that was never used. And, you know, I think people just wanted assurances back then that the inspection would be efficient at the dock so as not to transfer any invasive species and to monitor any illegal transport of natural resources. And we could have done that. But it's over. We have to move on. The ferries are not here any longer. So the cost to bring them back is not going to be, especially now with COVID, it's probably not going to be possible. I feel bad about young brothers. And I wasn't um, included in those discussions. I just know that they, they ran out of time. There just wasn't enough time in the shortened session to make a solid proposal. And you know, government needs to be very prudent about spending the money. So it wasn't something that we could just throw in there and hope that they would be able to succeed. There was just no guarantee that could happen. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Okay, Anna, the same question. What are your thoughts about the current situations with young brothers 
And would you entertain the possibility of a ferry system that would allow residents, especially farmers, to transport their goods to other islands? Thank you for the question, Charlie. This is an interesting concept and Representative Morikawa brings up a good point. Um, I was not for the super ferry for many reasons, um, being that we had a small island, limited capacity, and uh, there was already a lot of backup on the streets anyway because of rental cars and so on, among other um, more uh, serious issues, in my opinion. But this is the problem with a monopoly. <laughs> when we're dependent on one company to provide such a crucial service, there can be um, many issues that slip through the cracks. And being that this was the one company that was able to transport goods across island, you would think that there would be a profit margin. And, but of course, I am not the CEO. I'm not part of that business. This is me as an outsider making my opinions. I don't believe that it should be the government to save the situation. And if that were to be the case, it shouldn't be the state since we are so limited in our capacity right now. But if we're cut off from Young Brothers, there are other options that can happen with what we already have in place. There are airplanes that are traveling with not as many passengers, therefore the cargo is not as full. And we can have negotiations with the different airlines that are already transport, transporting and uh, using the fuel to get from A to B and C and all the islands. That can be a solution that we can think of and negotiate while Young Brothers um, is probably going to have to recalibrate their system and start over. And that is the exciting part of capitalism. When it works, it works. And if not, you can stand back and reassess the situation and start fresh. There's no limiting aspect to what can and cannot happen. So um, I don't feel that we should be fearful and uh, do something in a rash aspect that we can regret down the line. Okay. Thank you. Mel? Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Um, next question, Anna, we're going to start with you. What is your position on lifting the quarantine for incoming travelers to the state of Hawaii? And are you satisfied with the current policies in place? Well, Mel, thank you for this very loaded question because um, none of us, of course, are in a position to make that call and those that are in the position to make that call feel very heavily the responsibility on their shoulders. And it's basically a no-win scenario. I would appreciate the consideration for the governor to delegate this responsibility to the mayors so that each island can assess the situation themselves and make the proper choices. I am grateful that we've had a mayor that has led the charge. And it's easy for me to understand why we had to be so strict. We are on a small island, limited capacity, two hospitals. And there is precedence for this. There has been a flu where the entire island was shut down and it was okay. It's going to be different, a different mentality here for us to accept these intense measures than it is for the mainland to accept them. I believe having masks, every time I left the house, I had a mask on, I still do. My children did not leave. The quarantine was extended and extended and extended and we abided. So I feel strongly that it can be resolved if we're all responsible enough to consider this. It's out of respect for our kupuna, out of respect for those that don't have the choice themselves. Now, anything further than what I feel is a consideration, I would be against. I would be against any mandatory aspects of vaccination over intrusion. I am for informed consent. And I don't 
wish for the situation to escalate any further. There is a reason that the slippery slope argument exists when we have conversations in this way. So once, there's also another aspect to this. Um, anyone that was here on island during the fall experienced a highly intense flu that was out of the ordinary. It took very long to recover. So there is a consideration that we might have gone through this first and the quarantine eliminated it. We went to zero. So I'm hopeful that if everyone can just buckle down, finally understand what it means because the virus does exist and we don't have control over it. We have to humble ourselves. That's what I said from the beginning to everybody. Um, it's greater than us. And once we understand that, then we can move forward. But this is a wake up call. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, D, what is your position on the lifting of the quarantine for incoming travelers to the state of Hawaii? And are you satisfied with the current policies in place? I support quarantine for people coming in from out of state. I also support testing to get out of quarantine sooner than 14 days. How, when, and what kind of testing is the question. Until the governor and mayors can agree on a process, we cannot stop quarantine. Kauai's procedures are spot on though. They're probably the best in the state. You cannot sneak through if you're coming from out of state. In fact, let me tell you what happened to me. I went back to work for session. I had my exemption letter. When I came back, the guard and the police were right on me. And not just once, they came twice to check up on me. And that shows me how careful, how carefully they monitor travelers. I am not familiar with the other counties, but I do know that on Oahu, they're having a hard time tracking down these people. But for right now, our priority is to bring those numbers down. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Charles? Okay, we're gonna start with you first, D, And then Anna, you, you'll follow up with the same question. So D, the state relies heavily on tourism. What is your position on diversifying our economy as it relates to agriculture and the military? And what will you do to achieve this? Okay, COVID has taught us that we cannot rely on tourism as we have in the past. Now is the time to seriously think about diversifying our economy. I totally support our military. We, you know, we need them here on the West side. They are a big part of our community. And yes, agriculture is prime and we need to support it as much as we can. With the whole nation in COVID crisis, it's very possible that Hawaii could be an export of many products. That's why we're trying to get funding to, for initiatives that would spur manufacturing in Hawaii. You know, this is maybe going to be crazy, but while I was staying in Waikiki during the session the last few weeks, I saw these, the beautiful hotel shut down, dark, shops, restaurants closed, and some are going to be closed for good. Then I thought, if we had made Waikiki a gambling area, which was uh, something we're thinking about through the last um, uh, 2009 depression, you know, it would be thriving right now with local people, the, the ones that fly to Las Vegas over and over again, you know, this would have been the, a safer destination and those el elderly people wouldn't need to take those long plane rides. And you know, the revenue that we could have got for that could have gone directly to whatever mental health um, issues we needed to address, whatever education issues we needed to address that would have been huge and today it would have been great, but these are just my thoughts. And I'm, I'm sure there's many people shaking their heads out there, but you know, life is short. Let's have fun. If we can keep Hawaii safe, we can have a very thriving state. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Anna, same question. The state relies heavily on tourism. What is your position on diversifying our economy as it relates to agriculture and the military? And what will you do to achieve this? Thank you, Charlie. So this is a great question and um, I'm sure everybody understood that it was not sustainable to have 
all the eggs in one basket, even before COVID. What could be done? If we're gonna speak in hypotheticals, uh, what I had made the request of the council is to, as one body, represent Kauai and uh, face the state and request for there to be a substantial change in how we navigate uh, the aspect of tourism here and what it means. When you work in a business that profits off the land, air, sea, spring, river, aina, aloha, mana, you did not create the project. So the, you did not create the product. So it, it merits this conversation. In capitalism, by rule, it's ethical. You are not allowed to profit off exploitation and call it capitalism. If uh, there's anybody that's saying different, they're not fully understanding and maybe trying to disguise totalitarianism as capitalism. So in order to balance that out, instead of the taxes going to the state of these businesses, because we don't want to tax on top of taxes, they can be diverted to the counties where they are generated and serve as a fund similar to the Alaska Permanent Fund that uh, all the profits off oil goes into this fund and is distributed to the residents of Alaska as dividends paid, meaning it's money owed. As our natural resources, as this is the export that brings the economic sustainability to the island for many, many people, we need to have this conversation. So it's interesting that COVID has brought it to a blank canvas where we can reconfigure how the state will operate moving forward. And once this dividends paid alleviates a lot of the suffocation on local families in order to get through month to month, then small businesses can emerge as they ought to and wish to, limited with restrictions and allowing everyone to prosper in this free market. That's so important. It's a shame that we have to uh, depend on tourists to visit for the boutiques to stay open, for restaurants to stay open. We should all be participating in it together. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. We'll move on uh, to the next question. Anna, you will get the first, first response. This is question number seven. What is your definition of affordable housing? And what are your plans to deal with the uh, homeless and houseless issues here on Kauai? Do you support allowing state lands to be used for affordable housing in partnership with local nonprofits? Ready, set, go? Yeah, yes. <laughs> okay. Thank she knows you. She'll start the clock as soon as you start the answer. Okay. So the concept of affordable housing, it's not a sustainable experience. This is, um, of course, something that was worked out in order to balance out developers, increasing their profit margins and uh, providing something suitable for the community that is not able to purchase at that valued market amount. It's wonderful in philosophy and on paper, but it's ineffective because the problem is the county needs to subsidize the remaining portion that is not affordable to the purchaser. And there's limitations on the families that are living here. So it's not just the fact that it's not sustainable because the county has to cover the remainder. So if you have 400 units that are in production for uh, affordable housing, quote unquote, then the county has to subsidize the remaining amount of those 400 units. And that has to be discussed and brought into account for the county budget yearly, which is an issue. Another aspect to it is that the developers, in order to fulfill their affordable housing quota, they need to raise the price of their free market housing to balance out their profit margin. And now the price on the free market has increased and there's always going to be a buyer for it because we live in paradise. And once that is purchased at that amount, it serves as a comparable for all of the other real estate in the area to go off that amount. So we're increasingly chasing our tail, hamster in a wheel, trying to catch up with a something that is not going to happen. So we need to shift the conversation into what is attainable. 
attainable housing, somewhere where the infrastructure is already set and ready. And if the state is willing to provide the land, uh, I'm sure it, it cannot be uh, a purchase, but there can be some sort of negotiations at, at stake, that would alleviate a certain aspect of it. But there has to be a lot coming into the table, realizing that the paradigm is not working and we're gonna have to start fresh and accept that while we move forward. Those are my thoughts on affordable housing. Thank you very much. D, uh, what is your definition of affordable housing and what are your plans to deal with the homeless and houseless issues here on Kauai and do you support allowing state lands to be used for affordable housing in partnership with local nonprofits? Yep, we built our home 36 years ago on Ken's parents' lot. That was affordable. You know, people today need to, they have a mortgage of 2,500 and above to afford something that they can live with. And that's, that's a lot of money that goes just to housing. What is truly affordable is self-help housing or Habitat for Humanities, where sweat equity by families and friends help to build those homes. Uh, those homes, as you know, are um, expanding in LA. LA. Uh, more local people are ending up getting those homes and now in Waimea. I support, I totally support allowing state land to be used for affordable housing. The county's Lima Ola project in LA, LA would, would have done just that, where, you know, government um, would assist in infrastructure, so the home cost would be significant lower. But I just don't know where that project stands today. I haven't heard recently, but that, you know, as long as Habitat keeps on expanding in that area, I think we're, we're, we can get to that point sometime in the future. You know, for the homeless or the houseless issues, the best we can do right now is allow them to stay at the beach parks until the temporary shelters in Lihui are ready. You know, the loss of income due to the pandemic is forcing many people out of their homes. You know, although they can't be evicted, um, staying at Lucy Wright or any beach park or Lidgate is really not a bad thing at all. You see that all over, it looks terrible. But when the county and the state begin to open up for recreational use, these people need places to go. And those who have mental health issues are the ones who are hard to help. But the Department of Health has just started an initiative to deal with this, to deal with the mental health um, issues statewide. And I'm looking forward to that occurring in the future. It's just kind of slowed down a bit now with the COVID um, pandemic, but they have still maintained funding to continue their plans. Thank you. Thank you, Dee. Okay. Charles? We will start with you, Dee, and follow up by Anna on this next question, number nine. Uh, Dee. Do you support the legalization of recreational marijuana and lowering of the possession of dangerous drugs such as meth, cocaine, and heroin from a felony to a misdemeanor? Okay, I don't need much time for this one. No, I do not support it. I do not support reducing the possession of meth, meth cocaine, and heroin from a felony to a misdemeanor. And no, I do not support the legalization of recreational marijuana. I just strongly supported the use of medical marijuana. Thanks. Okay. Anna, same question. Do you support the legalization of recreational marijuana and lowering of the possession of dangerous drugs such as meth, cocaine, and heroin from a felony to a misdemeanor? Thank you. We're on the same page. Um, anything that's so powerful as cannabis should always be treated as medicine. And, uh, and understood deeply. As far as the um, other drugs that you mentioned, they are chemi chemical compounds after being manipulated in a lab or a makeshift lab. So they are no longer a natural substance and they are uh, direly harmful. I, I feel it, it's, it's more than just a crime. This is what the largest issue, the largest epidemic that affects our community is this severing of the soul. It is killing the essence of the person. 
And these conversations need to be had at that level when we're discussing this. It's not just a legal concept. It's not just what you can get away with or what you cannot get away with. It's the circumstances to these choices that we're making. And why is society as a whole choosing this route for themselves? We have to analyze this on every level available to us because that is the only way that we can ultimately make a difference, especially those that are elected in positions of power that can um, affect change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Mel? very much. Thank you. Anna, we'll start uh, question number eight for you. And I'm going to reword it because this was kind of more designed for the the Kapa'a corridor, but uh, the west side does have a traffic issue. As a representative of the Kauai people, what are your plans to ease traffic congestion here on Kauai and more specifically to the west side? Do you support an alternate uh, highway or an alternate route to assist in the congestion that is going to happen with the increased traffic on Kauai? So you're talking about the Malka Highway, which you know very well, I'm not for it. I don't think that we should expand on something, get more when we haven't done a good job with what we already have. There's a traffic flow issue. And uh, because of COVID, there is limited vehicles on the highway. The rental cars are, in fact, uh, what has the issue exponentially greater. If we do construct and spend billions of dollars that are not available to create a highway, we're gonna return to the same issue because the issue is bottlenecking when one road merge, merges into the other. So the simplest aspect would be to add two lane roundabouts. We can start with one at Tree Tunnel, one at Kalia, one at the airport would be fantastic and add from there. Anywhere we're going to add highways, we're going to add vehicles. And if we're talking about adding a highway down Mauka, Mount Wai Ale Ale, we're talking about down the line having a conversation at the Planning Commission about zoning it to neighborhood general, having constructions, having more highway issues of backed up traffic, pollution, litter, the aspects that we have to deal with on our highway itself. I think we should expand. That worked so well in Lihue. And the new options that we haven't even given a chance to that are far more feasible within the budget grasp. And while we're working on that, it's important to expand the highway to allow for pedestrians and bicyclists to navigate safely. It's an economic issue as well. Not everybody can afford a car and the bus doesn't go everywhere. So we need to provide that safety and use our funds to expand what we have, allow the flow to be continuous. That would relieve the bottlenecking that occurs and give us these pilot options that actually work that we can expand from there. So I'm against a Malka Highway, although any aspect, if we're going to add cane, cane Hall roads into our dynamic, we have to allow for roundabouts to enter and exit. Uh, because if not, we're going to have the same issue over and over and over and over. Thank you. D? Yep. Wait. As a okay. representative of the Kauai people, what are your plans to ease traffic congestion here on Kauai? Again, more specifically on the west side, do you support planning and development of a new uh, alternative route to accommodate the increased traffic on Kauai? Okay, I'm going to answer with the Malka Road first, and then I'll give some other thoughts. But right now, the traffic is smooth, which tells us that the tourism industry was a huge part of the problem. The plans that we have in place now, although it's not going to happen, but the plans in place are the four lanes that go from the Hui to Maluhia. And, you know, you're right, um, Anna, the roundabout at that tree tunnel is key. Um, we need to better evaluate the amount of rental cars allowed on the island in the future. And as for the Malka Highway, 
we missed the boat on that one in the 70s and 80s because we had the plan, we had the funding, it didn't make it. And I got that from Joe Rosa, yeah. You, you remember Joe uh, Mel? He used yeah, to work do. with the Department of Transportation, yeah. So that's gone. But as far as the West Side is concerned, there is a problem in Kalaheo. I have always, well, long ago, we used to take that road from Poipu and get over to LA, right? But now it's the coffee lands and there's the um, that uh, gardens there that we cannot go over because it's conservation land. But that would have been a route to alleviate the traffic from going through Kalaheo. As far as the, their, uh, the erosion on the west side, Kekaha, yeah, the water gets very close and we might lose that uh, road eventually, but we do have the um, inner road to depend on for now. And there is potentially, uh, we need to develop um, that whole route from Waimea to Kekaha that we can use as a pedestrian uh, bike path too. And that's, that's really gonna enhance the west side. But we are talking about that. And it's, it, to me, it's very exciting now that the county has that land between Kekaha and Waimea. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now we're gonna start with you, Dee, first and followed up by Anna, same question. Question 10, D, what is your position on the recently passed legislation that allows the disclosure of names of police officers prior to due process that have been disciplined by their respective departments? Yeah, Charlie, this bill gave us a lot of grief. And we, we, we certainly respect and honor our police officers, but the George Floyd incident made us see that something needed to be done. I want to read the first paragraph of the bill, and hopefully many will understand why this bill passed. The legislature finds that public trust in law enforcement is critical to ensuring justice for all under the law. The legislature find, further finds that the difficult and often dangerous job of law enforcement is safer, easier, and more effectively executed when citizens trust those empowered to serve and protect them. Now, I'm not familiar with the disciplinary process for police officers, but for other government employees, you aren't usually suspended or discharged without just cause and a full investigation. And you, you both, both of you were in the profession and have a lot of opinions about this. And I remember when um, I was much younger or <laughs> police officers were very helpful back then. You know, um, when you got pulled over for something, the officer usually would explain what you did, give you a very stern, stern uh, scolding and then send you on your way. You know, my friend and I got pulled over by an officer and we were, we were terrified when that happened. But when the officer came up to us and said, uh, I'm sorry, but one of, your dress is hanging out of the door. And if you don't put it in, it's going to be damaged. And we just cracked up. But I was so thankful that he saved my dress at that time. Now, though, I, I don't know what has happened now. But when you see a police officer on the side of the road or following you or coming at you, the first in instinct is fear. It's like, slow down, is anything wrong with my car? Do I have my papers in place? Did I do something wrong? And then when the blue light goes on, you think, oh Lord, it's a ticket. There goes my insurance rate. I think we've lost, we've lost something along the way, but I hope we can fix it. I, I truly want to make sure that our officers are respected. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And a same question. What is your position on the recently passed legislation that allows the disclosure of the names of police officers prior to due process that have been disciplined by their respective departments? Thanks for the question. It's a heavy subject. And um, maybe on Oahu, the situation is very dire, but I'm grateful on Kauai. Our police department is truly amazing and led by a spectacular police chief that makes it a priority to engage the community. So there's events where the community are invited to spend time with the police officers and the police chief and get to know the officers and have time for the community to share the issues that are going on. This is um, the framework for rebuilding the trust and the relationship 
in a department that holds so much power. But since we are all equal in the eyes of the law and um, the rule of law is, <laughs> it's our foundation. It's how we navigate these circumstances. I don't feel it was, it's just to expose uh, the individual and their future before due process. After, and uh, we are all innocent till proven guilty, then of course, take the measures at hand. Uh, maybe this bill needed to be passed because there's so much uh, covering up within the department and the situation in the nation has brought it to the attention that everyone needs to do the right thing at all times. Ethics is how we navigate these murky waters and allow for the police department and the officers to have a safe place to speak on the truth of what they experienced, what happened, and from there, take the measures necessary to prevent it from happening, which I see um, in my limited aspect here from just being a common citizen that there are police departments taking these steps. And before people took advantage of the fact that, oh, I can get away with it, I'll just, you know, it was just the, the way. And the way is uh, getting uprooted because it is no longer acceptable. But back to the point, um, due process is important. So that can, the, pend the pendulum can swing to the other way where good officers with really good intentions can be smeared in that same capacity. That's why the rule of law is, a, it's unequivocal, unequivocal and uh, should always be considered. Okay, thank, thank, thank you. you, Anna. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll go to our last question of the evening. This is a doozy. And we'll start with you, Anna. This will be question number three. There's a lot of talk about regulating uh, rental cars and visitor industry. Do you support, support granting the counties the home rule authority to implement local taxes and or surcharges such as rental car and visitor accommodation fees to create additional revenue streams to offset the deficits that are caused by COVID-19. Well, um, Mel, in 2017, in during your budget, I, I spoke on this concept of county tax. So we have a federal tax, we have a state tax, we should have a county tax because there is so much profit happening and it's just slipping through our fingers, right? The county receives their funds with property taxes, TAT and GT. So I'm assuming that um, this is referencing the lack of what we're projecting TAT for the county will be. I am for the rental car tax because of the effect that the amount of rental cars that were on island um, have to the community, to the way of life, to the neighborhoods, to the highway, to the parking lots, to the beaches, that whole concept. Now, are we going to get to that level anytime soon? I don't, how could we know, right? We can hope, but not to that extreme. We want to work out a balance. The concept that I referred to earlier is what I feel is the most just, which is the, the companies that are profiting off the island, those taxes that are already uh, being charged to them be diverted to stay on the county and uh, enhance the economic sustainability of the entire island so that the island can participate in the free market, buy their homes, pay their property taxes to the county. It's going to take a long time, but the fact that we have a clear slate to start over as the state uh, needs to be extremely patient 
on how we can place these measures that through time, all the other facets will fall into place because what we want for the future is a cohesive, working, sustainable economic model that does include small farms, does include small businesses, the regular people able to participate in the free market that we haven't had that opportunity yet. So everything will change. And I feel like I answered the question on that one. Did it come through at all? It did, it came through. Thank okay, you. thank you. D. Okay, do you thanks. support granting the counties the home rule authority to implement local taxes and our sur surcharges such as rental car and visitor accommodations to create additional revenue uh, to offset the deficits caused by COVID-19? When you talk about taxes at th that level, you know how hard it is at the legislature to really give those um, taxing authorities away, especially when the state is responsible for education and for the state hospitals. But the counties know best how to use local resources to garner their revenue that they need to uh, you know, address the impacts uh, from usage. The legislature did give the counties authority to use some of the GET for uh, transportation purposes and that has helped, but looking forward, it's not a very um, secure revenue stream. So I believe the counties can initiate higher user fees especially for non-resident visitors. The state parks are already trying to implement more impact fees for non-residents only um, to access parks. And Hyanna K and Koke are prime examples of how this can work. And this is a discussion that will need to happen because um, you know, everything has been free before. And now if you limit like how Haena Hanale does, if you limit the amount of vehicles that could go down and you need to pay if you're a non-resident to get down in there, it really is gonna um, save the environment. So that is the conversation that's gonna happen um, statewide. Kauai Hanale was the pilot and we see how it can work and it can limit our numbers. And I think that's where we probably need to go. And having worked in Parks and Rec, I, I really truly believe in user fees where, where it can be um, implemented. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Now we'll finish up with our closing comments and you'll both have five minutes again to uh, wrap it up and get the people, the viewers to uh, to vote for you. So um, D, we will start with you again. Uh, can, I, can I uh, yeah. also remind them, uh, Mel, that yes. if you have any contact information that the people can contact you directly if they have questions, I think well, now would be the time to, to get that information out there. So you can reach the constituents and uh, maybe if they have any questions in regards to what was asked of you tonight and maybe need more clarification, you can give them that opportunity. I think it would be best worthwhile for you folks. Okay? Thank you, Charlie. Whenever you're ready, Dee. Okay, thank you. I wanna take some time to explain my role as the majority floor leader. You know, I'm part of the leadership team with Speaker Psyche. And all legislation that comes out of committees gets to the floor where we pass them out to the next committee and eventually to final votes if they survive. I support the chair's decisions to move bills because I know that further discussion can promote compromise. But because of this support, some people have become very upset with me. If there's one negative thing about this job, it's stress. No. Many have commented on my gray hair, like, what happened to her? Because all my political and official pictures, I was dark hair. I just suddenly became gray, right? Um, it's, it's because I worry a lot. That's, that's what happened, right? No, it's in my genes. I just never I didn't want to believe it. You know, I really do take this job seriously, and I'm constantly thinking about problems and solutions. And in my other life plan, I was supposed to retire at 55, then go back to school to try to become a substitute teacher. But here I am talking to Mel and Charlie. 
Even through many stressful situations and dealing with unhappy and critical people, I love what I do. I love this work so much. I haven't missed a day of session in for the past 10 years. Yeah, the decisions I make are based on extensive discussions, testimonies, emails, phone calls, using facts and common sense. I cannot make everybody happy because there's always two sides to an issue, which is why I would justify my decision and we just have to agree to disagree. But ultimately, we must do what we can for the health and safety of the public. There is no doubt that these are scary and uncertain times. This COVID pandemic has changed our lives where we need to adjust to a new normal. So pause for a moment, go outside, look around, see the beauty of this island, take a deep breath and think how lucky we are to live in a place where the mountains are our backyard, the ocean is our front yard. Be thankful that you can contribute to society and that you have loving and caring family and friends. Even as horrific as this pandemic is, life goes on and we must live it the best way we possibly can. Let's try for more positivity and let go of the negatives. Positive energy is healthy. Every session I have communicated with constituents prior to the start of the session to kind of give people an idea of what my priorities are for that year. And then at the end of session, I'll send out a newsletter to report what we accomplished, what didn't make it, and just give constituents a message that would be dealing with any issues at that time and give them some reassurances that I am here for you and that I am very accessible. So I can be reached through the Capitol website and it's under um, the State of Hawaii uh, Legislature. I can also be contacted at daynet.morikawa at gmail.com. My office manager, Kikaha um, Boy, Mark Moragan, will give anyone my cell phone number so they can call me anytime. You know, for all of my 10 years in office, I've heard the cry for change. I ran for office for, for that reason. I want to change. I've lived on Kauai for 46 years and change happens whether we like it or not. We just have to adapt. So you say change what? The politicians? When things don't go your way, you want change. You want a person who will do your bidding even though it isn't what most people want. I believe I was elected by voters who trust me to do the right thing to make their lives better. That is why I'm running for re-election to House District 16 and I humbly ask for your support and allowing me to continue working for you. Mahalo. Thank you. Thank you, Dee. Anna, your five minutes. You may begin. You Again, thank you for this opportunity. And uh, thank you, Representative Morikawa, for being here. And uh, I understand the level of intensity that you experience on a daily basis. And uh, believe it or not, I have gray hairs just from being worried myself as an outsider. <laughs> so that is uh, something I will always respect, being a woman, having gotten to that level of authority where you are House Majority Leader. Is, uh, is a great feat. So I'm not running because um, of any criticism. I'm running because of what are the priorities that I see are pertinent to the future of our island. And being in that position, if you felt the same way I did, it would be done because you have that access already that you gained through years and dedication and the relationships that you've built. So all that being said, with all due respect, three years ago, I made a commitment to myself that if I cannot fully confidently trust my vote to someone else on the ballot, that I will be on the ballot myself. And I ran for mayor because I couldn't vote for anyone else. It was a continuation on what I said time and time again before the council, a request that I made of them. The request did not navigate through. I know I am asking so much and I know that the state is going to resist in this change, but look what that led to. There is no choice on the matter. The, budget will not be there 
that the state has relied on. And education and hospitals are, of course, priority. Infrastructure is priority. So that navigation will have to happen. But there is so much more beneath the surface of what ails us. And the solutions are through policy initiatives that break ground. Floods happen after I started appearing before the council a volcanic eruption and now we have a pandemic. Uh, before I ran for mayor, I submitted my letter of dissent the last time that I testified before the council and it turned into a demand. After a demand, it's a command and that does not happen for me. So all of us that feel this is an extreme time in human history that are inspired to participate like myself, where I have no business being here, I know very well <laughs> what I'm up against. And so I'm reaching out to the community to support me because going up against House Majority Leader, established incumbent Democrat for 10 years as a newcomer and Republican, nonetheless, in this state that is, it's unheard of. So consider where this courage is coming from, for me to step forward and do something like this. There's more at stake than what we see with our plain eyes. And it's through God's will. And we have to consider that whatever decision we take, it's not so simple. It's not just what's legal and what's not legal. It's what is ethical moving forward. So we can right the wrongs, start fresh, and allow all of us to prosper together so we can participate in this paradise, knowing that if our children are fed, all the children are fed. If our children have a hot bath before bed, all the children are able to experience that. Go to school together, have a community where one doesn't feel run over by another because that's not why capitalism exists. Alexander ha Hamilton had this breakthrough idea in order to get under the thumb of tyranny so that every man, woman, and child can grow out of whatever situation they've been born into. So it's not a caste system where you, you were born here, you're gonna die here. And that does happen around the world. America is not for that. And we have to expand this philosophy so that everyone can reach this potential. There's so much moving forward, so many parts. And I'm grateful for your time. Mahalo. Thank you both uh, for joining us tonight. Appreciate you guys' uh, respect for the time. That was amazing. We made it right at 7.59. That is like amazing. Thank you. Uh, we wish you both the best. You know, the one thing that sucks about elections is somebody wins, somebody loses. And I've been on both sides of it. So, you know, it is what it is. But I wish you both the best. Work hard and, um, and get your word out. And um, we wish you guys the best. Charlie, any closing comments before we get the heck out of here? <laughs> well, I can say thank you to both you, D and Anna. Thank you so much for joining Mel and I tonight, for uh, answering our questions and just giving your honest honest responses because that's all you can do and for our viewers up there everything else is uh left up to you this year is going to be different it's going to be mail-in ballots if you haven't done so i encourage you to do so i know there's more ballots that's been mailed out than ever before because before Kauai has always had a low turnout we can make a change if there's a change that you, you know everyone's talking about whether it's a policy or if it's an individual it's all up to the constituents to do that and tonight we heard from the candidates for, for uh, District 16. And, I, and, and there was a lot of things I would say that, uh, that's thought provoking and it's good. And like you said, Dee, we can agree to disagree. And Anna, your, your philosophy is, is, is somewhat new. And, and, and for me, I, I tell the viewers, hey, look at it because Mel and I, all we do is we bring them forward to you. You folks make the decision. We will not make the decision for you. I just want to get that straight with our viewers because every time we always get that question and it's the thought is 
No, we bring it to the viewing audience and it's there for you. We bring the information to you. So I, I thank all of you for tuning in tonight. Over to you, Brother Mel. Thank you, Charlie. And again, thank you to the viewers who uh, gave up your Saturday evening to learn about our candidates. Thank you to the candidates to, uh, who took your time to be here tonight. I know it's tough on a Saturday. Uh, and, and for those of you tomorrow night, we obviously we don't work on Sundays anymore. Is this even work? I don't know. But on Monday, Dr. Jerome Kim, Kim. from uh, South Korea will be on our show at 7 o'clock. He's uh, one of the leaders in the, at the um, Institute, Institute. Uh, the International Vaccine Institute, and uh, it'll be it'll be it'll be very informative. Whether you support vaccines or not, he's going to give us a science behind it, and I think it, it's going to be worth everybody's while to tune in. Um, aside from that, thank you. Um, you guys all stay safe. You have a great evening. You take care. God bless all of you. We love you guys, and we'll see you guys on Monday night.